the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. Run your law firm the right way. way. This is the Maximum Liar Podcast. Maximum Liar Podcast. Your hosts, Jim Hacking and Tyson Mutrix. Let's partner up and maximize your firm. Welcome to the show. Hey, it's Jim. What's going on, Jim? It's Tyson. Tyson, how was your week? Good. It's been a great few weeks. I know that we had a break because uh, we had a baby and you're on your side you had uh, Ramadan. So, But it's been a great few weeks. So how about you? I'm glad to get back in the saddle. I've been doing some more recording, shot some videos this week, doing some blog posts. So it's good to get back in the swing of things. Nice. Yeah, you had that good uh, podcast interview with Dean Jackson, which was really awesome. Oh, you know, that made my month for sure. That was uh, very interesting. Come on, who are you I- kidding? That made your year. It really did. I mean, you know, I've I've done a lot with Dean. I did the email marketing class that he teaches, and I did a book with his team, which really was easy. And maybe I'll talk about that in a future episode. But today we're talking about building a referral network. And it's interesting that you and I have both tried lots of different ways to build our network. And I thought we'd talk about some of those today. Absolutely. I think it's a great topic. I think something that everyone can use. Your referrals are your most important thing. For me, at least, I think for you, referrals from other attorneys for me are are the most valuable cases I have. They're usually the best cases. They're the most qualified leads I have. And it's just, it, they mean the most to my business. If you're getting people that find you either on the internet or on in the yellow pages, to the extent people still use the yellow pages, I think that a lot of times those guys are just looking for a warm body that does what we do and they just, there's no loyalty or, you know, there's no pre-selling of us as a service provider. And, and if we don't call them back within three minutes, they're going down the list to the next uh, phone number. And they're also more willing to try and negotiate your price down, which is, just crazy to me though i remember when i used to do a lot more criminal defense they'll call and they're just calling to get a price they don't care about it you're right how good you are they don't care about your reputation nothing they just want that warm body that you were talking about and so they're willing to just ask uh, you to take just the most basic amount of money just to take a really high-end case and so it changes a lot of things for you whenever you have that warm handoff from someone and someone vouching for you You can certainly charge a lot more money for your cases because you can charge what you're worth, which is nice to do. Yeah, I think that you can't underestimate the value of having someone go to bat for you ahead of time. I mean, it's one thing for you to sing your own praises on your website or to talk about how great you are and all that stuff. And I think lots of lawyers like to do that. But I think that when someone else does it for you, when someone identifies what the issue is that you need help with and then tells you who the go to person is, I think that's really important. You know, something you did, which was kind of something you'd said a while back, which was interesting to me is whenever you and I both experimented with BNI, which is Business Network International, you said something about, you know, all I do is I hang out with white people and I I want to get out of my comfort zone. And it's it was kind of interesting because it's it's true. I mean, BNI was it was definitely out of the comfort zone. But you do things which is really great. You get outside of your bubble and you go and meet other people. And I think that you've done a really good job of just it's not even that you've been going out and doing, you know, business networking. It's just going out networking in general, hanging out with people to get out of your comfort zone. I think that's really benefited you, hasn't it? I definitely want to talk a little bit about BNI because I think that one thing that was great about BNI for us both 
was that it really helped us be more methodical and to think through networking. And I think that's really important. And what I meant with that comment, you know, I love white people, but when you're an immigration attorney, the likelihood of you meeting people that know immigrants is a little bit different when you're hanging out with, you know, people from sort of, you know, the suburbs. And I think that when, you know, we looked at it, it just seemed like our time could be better spent dealing with immigrant communities and sort of doing a little bit more targeting outreach of building our network. And so I think that the great value for BNI, and I would recommend any new lawyer, especially a general practitioner who's just sort of getting started, I think BNI is a great way to network with people and to build connections, to get referral partners and people that trust you, know, like, and trust you that are willing to go to bat for you. And I think that if you're doing a general practice, there's a lot of value to that. And even if you've niched down into practice areas other than immigration, like for instance, if you are a young lawyer and you want to set up a wills and estates and trusts and probate practice, I think BNI is a fantastic place to meet the kinds of people that would need your service. I just think with immigration, it's a little bit different. And what it would be great for me would be a BNI of immigrants. Absolutely, I think you're right. And I, I don't think it works for every single practice. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were in BNI for that almost that year and you didn't get one referral. Is that right? I got some connections. I didn't get any actual like case referrals, but there definitely were some people that it's been good for me to meet. Well, the connections I think are the most important part. I think that that's the most important part is making those connections because those will lead to referrals down the road. And that's part of building your network. And you're a prime example, though, of how BNI doesn't always work, though, because you had met everything that every requirement in the entire group. You actually were leading the group in sending referrals, doing one to ones, doing everything that they required. They've got that traffic light system. You were green on everything, I believe. And the vast majority of the group was not. And but you weren't getting the referrals, but you're right. So it doesn't work for every business, doesn't work for every practice. I can tell you, I got some very valuable cases, personal injury cases, but I think that those are flukes. I think that it's hard to generate referrals with personal injury cases in a BNI type of setting because people are, are seems like they're always trying to get that quick referral to you just to meet their numbers. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I sometimes not with everybody, but sometimes it's just trying to, okay, I'm going to send you, you know, whatever someone just calls me about, I'm just going to send it to you. It's not really them looking for a personal injury case, but I had no problem with BNI. I thought it was great that the main issue was just the time. I think the time commitment for both of us was just way too much. That's part of the problem with BNI. I, it's, it's not really a problem if you have time to do it, but that's why I think there are more organic ways of building your network that you don't have to get into that, that system. You don't have to get into that BNI system just to do it. To me, the real value of it comes from the discipline of being conscious and deliberate in going out and getting referrals and meeting people. And so, you know, some of those people in our BNI group are still really good friends. And But I think that for a new lawyer or a new practitioner or a new business owner, that having that discipline to, you know, think about your leads, think about contacts, thinking about giver's gain and about how you can help the other person. I think it definitely gets you in the right mindset of the person, the people in charge of the BNI in St. Louis, where we live, are great people. Yes. Moose Keys, and we've learned a ton from them about how to, you know, build a network. And I think that, you know, this is one of the big things they don't teach you in law school. So I certainly agree with you that it's, it's a big time crunch. But when you're a brand new lawyer, if you're if you're hanging out your shingle and you feel like you don't know a lot of people, I think it's a great way to hack or jumpstart that part of your your part of your business development. And you probably have nothing but time anyways when you're first starting your firm. There's, there's right. a lot of downtime. I and you you did you said her last name, but I want to make sure people know her name. Virginia Muse Keys. Is it M U S Q U I Z? Yeah, I think so. Just in case anybody wants to contact the local BNI, she's a great person to contact. She has that, uh, she actually has that referral thing, right? Some sort of referral network class. Yeah, the Referral Institute, which I actually did that too. And that was sort of like an all day immersion kind of a thing, a mastermind on the building of your network. Did you get any benefit from that? I did. I got some really good friends from that. And I got a contact to a local university that's turned into lots of cases and so that's sort of what i mean is that it was more than the it wasn't that people were delivering me cases so much when i was in bni but it was it made good connections and i think that's important because i think that you know you don't ever want to be the guy at the party or the lady at the party hanging out your card and being 
cheesy saying, ooh, send me cases, ooh, send me cases. I think that any kind of network worth its salt is one that's built on, you know, mutual assistance and, you know, that develops over time. You don't want to be cheesy and quick. So you just, what you just said, it actually leads in perfectly with what I was wanting to talk about. Two things, right? Giver's gain, you said that with BNI. I think that is tremendous. It, it, it actually means quite a bit. That, but that also wraps into the book, The Go-Giver, that I've talked about before, Five Principles. And it's about just giving more into life than what you get out of it. It's just the if I were to give it one basic overarching principle, that's it. And it's not, you know, it's it's not all about me getting referrals, me getting referrals. It's me giving because you will, if you give, you will gain. And that sounds so cheesy, but it is so true. And you know it is. It's something that you and I have both experienced. And I try and go out of my way to do things for people. One, it makes you feel good. But two, you get so much out of it. And I know people listening to this that have not really experienced that may it be hard to believe. But it is so true that if you go out there and you go out of your way, try and give referrals to people. I, I mean, you and I have both in our offices, we get a lot of referrals for other cases or we get calls on cases we don't handle and we make an effort to refer those to people. We don't just tell them to go down the road and call someone else. We actually make efforts to have them call somebody else that we know does that practice area to give them that referral. And we make sure that attorney knows it comes from us so that they know that they're getting something from us. And I think that's very, very valuable. Another great thing that Virginia taught us, and maybe we should have Virginia on the show sometime, but one of the great things that she taught us was like how to give a referral and how to receive a referral. And so, you know, it's really important that when you refer someone to somebody that you make a good connection, you explain to them, you know, why you're connecting them, you make sure that the person understands that you're giving them this referral and that it's not with any kind of ulterior motive. I mean, there's a guy in my building, our friend Steve Bartle, who's a divorce attorney, and I've probably referred him 10 or 15 cases over the last couple of years. And he definitely tries to send me immigration stuff. But at the end of the day, if you have the mindset of just trying to help people, that good karma, it all comes back. It might not be a one-to-one you know, referral situation, but I definitely think that that mindset is definitely the way to go. I think we, if, I think we break break down the mental component of it. Um, it, it's not karma, right? It's not karma. It, it's, there is the tit for tat kind of thing with it. And the, the book influence talks about that. It's the reciprocity principle. And I know that that's not why we're doing it. It's not to give. So we get back. It's, it's that the whole idea of just giving, you know, giving, but the reciprocity principle is at play. If you're giving referrals to these attorneys, they do feel that obligation to give back to you. And so that is the big part of it. So I think if we if we just glossed over that, I think that would be a mistake. That's why I believe I've recommended influence in one of my Tyson's tips, because it is such a mind blowing book. If you read it, it's one of those ones where it just if you were to take it and you could you could really use it to manipulate your clients, which I don't recommend it. But that's not what the book's about. The book's about understanding people in general so that you can better target them with your marketing. It is a very, very good book. It's by Robert Cialdini. If I have not mentioned it before, I think it's fantastic. So I, I think we, I, I definitely want to talk about the psychological element of it too, because I believe the averages, if you give someone something, they repay it seven times, I believe is what the number is. And I could be off a little bit with that, but it's that's a pretty, uh, pretty mind-blowing number if, if it's true. And I think that the giving of a referral, you know, obviously, you know, you don't want to refer someone that's going to make you look bad. No, so a lot of people don't give referrals to help us. People give referrals to make themselves look good and to show that they are connected and that they know the right people. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten referrals from lawyers that I've never heard of. And so I think that's, you know, partly based on our reputation, partly based on our website and our AVO rating and all that stuff. But I think that you got to keep in mind that they're not doing it to help you. People don't wake up in the morning and say, Ooh, who can I refer to Tyson today? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it is kind of funny you say that because I, I get that random phone call. They'll say it's from, you know, such and such in Kansas city and I'll have no idea who they are. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. You know, how are they doing? And like, oh, yeah, they're great. I talked to them earlier today. I'm like, and I don't know how it happens. It's it's weird. I don't know how or why attorneys, whenever someone calls, they just pick a random, they, they probably just pick a random person from Google or whatever they do. But it's kind of interesting how that works. And I like what you were talking about, though, with that handoff. So whenever someone calls you 
and you then refer it to that attorney though, I think it is extremely important that they know the person's name, person's phone number, the main issue, any other information, really the more information you can give that attorney, the better. And you want to make sure that that transfer takes place. You want to make sure that that client calls that person or that that attorney calls the client, whatever the arrangement is. For example, you refer me case, you, you make sure you let me know if I'm supposed to call the person or if they're going to call me. And I think the best way of doing it, this is the way that you and I do it normally, is when you refer me a case, you say, go ahead and call and I call them. And that way, you know that the transfer is taking place because waiting for the client to call a referral partner can sometimes take weeks, you know, days, weeks, months, or may not at all. So I think it's important to have the attorney call the potential client. Well, I think that goes without saying. I mean, I think that if you refer someone to an attorney and they have a bad experience, then that's going to make it a lot less likely for you to be willing to refer them in the future. Right. Something you hinted on or touched on with, you know, getting someone that's bad in your referral network. Yeah, I think you got to cut them out right away. I mean, don't you? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, yeah. You don't want that bad egg because it makes you look bad. Doesn't your friend and our friend John Fisher have some pretty strict approaches to referring and using attorneys? It was not, no, it's not John Fisher. It's a really good attorney out of Chicago and it's uh, Michael McCreary. It's M C C R E A R Y. And Michael's a really good attorney and he has a written contract that he sends out to his referral partners and he will not, he will not refer you cases unless you agree to it. And it is, you know, that you'll call the referral within so many hours. It's that you'll return all phone calls from, it's, it's like this list of things that you must do with each client. It's basically just good client satisfaction is what, what the agreement is, but it's actually pretty strict. And it also, if they're, if they're co-counsel on it, they have to get weekly or monthly updates or something like that. It's pretty intense. Actually, I can share it on, I can share it on the website. He, well, let me talk to Michael, make sure it's okay, but I, I'm pretty sure he'll let me share it on the website. All right. So what about specifically with referrals from other attorneys? I mean, I think we've talked generally about referrals and networking and those kinds of things. But what about working with other attorneys that you want to refer or receive cases from? You're just talking about building that network? Just about, you know, the interaction, the the cadence of it, the connection. And like, do you refer all of your cases of a particular type to one attorney or do you do you spread it out? I actually spread it out and I, what I do is, if, for example, a family law case, if it's someone, I, I try to gauge the, their income level because I think that that's a big part of choosing who they can choose. And so I have, I have almost a tiered system of people that are expensive, cheap, and kind of mid-level and right. that are all good. And part of that taken into consideration is how new they are, because the newer you are, usually the cheaper you are. But I always vet them first to make sure that they're going to take care of the person. And so sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually give them, gauge their level of, of what they can pay. And then I'll either give them a couple different names, which I don't like to do, or I'll, I'll, after getting their their needs, I'll just refer it to whomever's in that that income level or that pay level, the, the price level. But no, I do so. I do spread it out. I usually only have one or two within that level, though. So, for example, a family attorneys, I only have one really expensive family attorney. I recommend. I have a couple in the mid level, and then I've got one that's in like a lower level. So this is so great for so many reasons, what you said. Number one, this reminds me that I have a referral I have to give to Bartle on a family matter. Number two. I think that what you just said really demonstrates another great benefit of cases that are referred versus cases that come off the internet or something. And that is that Tyson, you are pre-qualifying the person before they even contact the lawyer. So you're helping the lawyer by doing some of the legwork to, to qualify them. And so, you know, when, when you're talking about a networking situation, you want to make sure that people have a firm understanding of the kinds of cases that you want to take and the kinds of clients you want to work with. So, you know, it's so great to be having people sort of delivered to you or recommended to you that are already the kinds of clients that you want to work with, because that just really cuts down on a lot of the back and forth and sort of having to turn cases down. It is partially for the benefit of the attorney that I'm referring to, but the primary benefit is for the client that's calling because I don't want to send a bad referral. And it's 
And so other attorneys are the same way as we are. They do the same things we do. They want to make sure that they're not sending a bad referral. So you're right that I am pre-qualifying them, but it's for the benefit of the client because, I mean, I could give them the most expensive attorney's name. I could do that, but I mean, they're not going to be able to afford them. And so it's just a bad referral. And it's, it's, a, it's a waste of the attorney's time. It's a waste of the client's time. And I mean, you and I know that you hate taking these calls on cases that are just, they're pointless cases. They're either they're bad cases or they're not the type of case you take. And so it can be a pain whenever we're taking these cases or these calls and stuff. So you want to make sure you do qualify them for the other attorneys. Yeah. And I think that definitely with people who you refer to that, you know, having that firm understanding of what you want the client to get and the kind of representation you want, I don't think you want to do it just on price. I think you want to work towards getting a firm understanding of what kind of people they want to work with. But another good thing about networking and getting clients from networking is that it's great that your own clients view you as the center spoke of legal issues so that if if people have any kind of legal issue, they come to you first. I think that's really important that, you know, when you are that trusted advisor for whatever practice area or whatever thing you've helped them with in the past, that if they feel comfortable enough with you and they trust you enough that then then they're going to look to you to help them solve their other legal problems. And I think that's a very good place for a lawyer to be. You are so right. And it's, I know we talk about niching down and that's not what we're talking here. We're not talking about niching down. We're talking about just being the hub and it's a different way of looking at things and something that I know that you've got coming up with your webinar. You're talking about doing a, a Facebook webinar or a Google Hangouts webinar in the next month or so. I've got my Monday Q&A. There's a lot of things that you want to be. You just want to be that guy that everyone goes to. You, so you want to be that hub so you can start dishing out the cases. There's a, a ton of benefits to that. And you can only be that guy, though, by building that network of people. And that's really, really important. But if you're the guy that everyone goes to, then you can dish out those referrals and you can definitely grow your network that way. So I know that we take a slightly different approach on the content that we create. And I've been wondering, how have you found your Monday videos as far as addressing issues that aren't your ideal client or ideal practice area? I understand it as a concept, but I wonder if that's been working for you or if you'd be better off just focusing on the types of, I mean, there's so many questions just within personal injury that I think that if you just did that, you might have a certain type of response and then answering questions just generally. How have you found that? It's not as hard as you might think. What I'll do sometimes is I'll, I'll send an email to an attorney friend of mine and I'll ask them what the answer is and I'll use that as the answer. So that's the easy way of doing it. There's a couple times where I've had to research the issue, but it hasn't taken me a whole lot of time. And Here's something you don't know is I have the benefit of looking up the answer, choosing my answers. I only pick three per week to answer. And so if there's something that's really, really complicated that it's going to take too long to research, I don't do it. I don't answer that one. So there is that. But there's another benefit, though, is whenever I do the video, I talk about how I only do personal injury, right? I say criminal defense too, personal injury and criminal defense. So I'm hammering in their head that that's all I do. And so that they know that, but they still ask me the questions anyway. So I'm still the go-to guy. So I'm niching and I'm also answering all these people's questions for them. So I, I think it's a huge benefit because I get a ton of questions from people and that snowballs into other questions I get through Facebook messenger on a daily basis. And so I'm just their go-to person and it's almost like being their family attorney. You know, it's kind of an interesting dynamic that, that that's created. And so I know exactly, I had the same concern because of the niching and all that, but it has not been an issue. I like to send you dirty questions on that, but you know, <laughs> we're, we're talking about, we're talking about referrals and let's finish up with one other little topic. And that's something that I'm not very good about and I need to be better about. Can I put a kind of a wrap on that, the money Q and I really quick. Yeah, sure. So I guess how that relates to building a referral network is, I'm providing a free service for a ton of people. And what it is, is people can submit their question to me for free and I will answer it every Monday. I'll answer three questions at, for free. Uh, you just send me your, you send me your question. And so what I'm doing is, is I'm providing just free legal advice is what I'm doing. And so it's expanding my network and I've had people just, they've never submitted a question. They'll just say, Hey, it's great. I, I saw your Monday Q and a, and they'll refer me a case. It's really, it's really interesting how that works, but it's, it's a way of building my network. So I want to make sure that people understand that's why I knew that. Okay. So anyway, getting back to referrals and one thing I'm not so good about, and that is 
you know, following up with the person that referred you? What What do you like to do for that? Where the scenario is I've referred a case to that person? No, someone has referred a case to you. Oh. They send you a nice new client. Oh. How do you follow up with the person to thank them? So I send handwritten cards, but uh, something you know that with Infusionsoft, for, and I had to fix, there's a glitch in it because you refer me multiple cases. And so I, you weren't getting all the letters, but there is an update. I'll give you an example of how you can kind of forget it, but how significant it is, is in Infusionsoft, I have systems built up where at each stage of the process uh, or at most stages of the process, the referring attorney will get an update on what's going on. And so, for example, you got that letter. I tricked you a couple times. You got a couple letters from me where it says, just thank you for referring the case. I also like to send handwritten cards. But just most recently, I had a referring attorney. She referred me a case and I forgot that she referred me a case. But the client had just gotten done treating. And so an email was automatically generated and sent to her saying, updating her on the status of the case. And she sent me an email back. Oh, thanks so much for updating me on this. This is great to know, blah, blah, blah. And so just simple things like that, I have those systems built in. On really good cases, I'll send a, a nice gift, you know, bottle of wine, uh, whiskey, something like that. I wouldn't send that to you, but uh, other people I, I, I do. Right. So I do things like that. There are, great. there are certain times where you cannot give those updates to people just because of attorney-client privilege. So if there's no co-counsel agreement on it, then you, ethically you can't. But there, I mean, you can definitely send that. At, at a minimum, you need to send a thank you card. Yeah, I need to be better about that. And I need to make it more systematic. It's sort of hit and miss when I do that or don't do that. And you have no excuse because you have Infusionsoft. I have no excuse. That's right. All right. So speaking of no excuses, time to wrap this show up, brother. All right. Give your hack of the week. All right. My hack of the week. I have found a better podcast player and it's called Overcast. I really like it. It's a great little app. It's free. The things I like about it are the interface is a lot prettier than iTunes, but more importantly, it allows you to, the podcast player will automatically delete the spaces between when people are talking. So I'm not one of these guys that likes to listen to podcasts at two times or one and a half times the speed, but that little feature I've really enjoyed. It's gotten the podcast down a little bit shorter because I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. And then the other thing it does is it can boost the audio of the speaker. So sometimes, you know, some podcasts, Still don't have great sound quality. Hopefully ours will and do, but it's just a, a nice little, it's available for Apple and for Android. It's called Overcast. Overcast. Okay. That's surprising. I, I like iTunes and I don't really want to get out of my comfort zone, but I'll, I'll try that one. Overcast. Cool. All right. Tyson's tip of the week is Hootsuite. It's H-O-O-T-S-U-I-T-E. It's an app or you can go online and do it too, but it allows you to schedule out your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, I believe your LinkedIn posts. So for example, you could, I mean, for months out, you could schedule all your posts and you could just come up with a topic. You could set up your blog post, your videos. You can use that to schedule out your posts. And it's a very, very, very easy service to use. And it's something that allows you to really save a lot of time that way you're not constantly trying to, you know, think of, oh, what am I going to do next? What, what am I going to post today just to keep yourself in front of other people? And also what it does is it allows you to look at your editorial calendar and actually schedule out things, which is really good. So Hootsuite is, is something I recommend. I'm sure it has tremendous value. And I know that it would be good for me to use to make it more systematic as to when I post things. The one thing that I always sort of giggle about or am amazed by are when people have these auto posts set and then something happens. So I remember this author that I really like named Daniel Pink. He had a series of tweets set to go out around his television show. So he had a television show that was debuting. And he had all these auto tweets set up. And then like an hour before his show started on cable, there was a terrorist attack or something bad really happened. Somebody died. Oh, no. And so he's sending out all these auto posts and people just jumped all over him like, dude, do you have no respect? I mean, what's your problem? And so he really had to walk it all back and apologize. And, you know, he's such a great guy. He did. But that's the one little trepidation I have about you know, auto posting and sort of that if this, then that approach to posting. I'm willing to spend the extra, like with my daily blog, I go through and I launch all the social media organically. I don't do it with a, and it takes me all of a minute. So I just, I'm sort of skittish about automating that. And it, it might be me being 46 years old and old, but I just, that's the one sort of concern I always have in the back of my head. It's actually, it's a great point. And I'm actually, I'm glad you said something. If you watch it, you'll see it. You can tell when people are auto posting. And sometimes 
when something's going on, especially if it's sort of related to what they auto post about, that's sort of interesting. There's a huge advantage, and you and I t- have talked about this before, is actually being engaged on Facebook and how, because Facebook is such free advertising. It's such great because you're, you're actually, people are, are tapped into you, they're, you're tapped into them. So there is something to, to be said about just, you know, being tied into that and actually communicating, not just pushing stuff out. So I completely get that. But it's, it's more yeah. of a, it's not like I do a bunch. It's I think it's something if you do it small amount, I think it's it's something that could help you out. I think that's right. I mean, Gary Vaynerchuk's big time against auto posting and pre posting. But yeah, I think if you do it like once or twice a day, that's great. But other than that, I wouldn't recommend it. Right. All right, let's wrap this baby up. All right, we'll talk to you next week. Right, thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Maximum Lawyer Podcast. To stay in contact with your host and to access more content, more content. go to MaximumLawyer.com. Maximum Have a great week and catch you next time.